In this video, I'm going to present you with a data analysis conceptual process called measure, evaluate, and operationalize. Now this is the first video in a three-part series that's a partnership between Hawk and Dynamics and myself, Dr. Jacob Gooden, professor of sports science and kinesiology here at Point Loma Nazarene University. Now in this first video, I want to do a few things. I want to first lay out the MEO process and then also give you a framework for starting the monitoring process today. In the second video, I want to clarify some essential statistical methods that you can use as a strength coach or as a sports scientist to evaluate the data that you've collected. And then in the third video, I'll give you the tools that you need to operationalize your data, feeding it forward into the training process. Now, as a strength coach or sports scientist, I'm sure you're familiar with the typical athlete performance testing battery. Now, close your eyes with me and imagine, if you will, the following scenario. You have 30 some athletes coming in, three performance tests to perform, dozens of collected variables because like any smart sports scientist or strength coach, you're using Hawk and Dynamics force plates to do the data collection. It's 6 a.m. because that's the only time that all the athletes could be there. They're student athletes, they have schedules, they have practice, have classes. And because your sports science program is still in its early stages, the coaching staff and even some key administrative personnel wanted to be present for this testing battery. Now, if this scenario sounds familiar to you, it's because it's playing out across dozens, if not hundreds of colleges and universities across the country that employ sports science into their strength and conditioning programs and hope to integrate it for athletic performance and the success of their sports programs. However, sports science is still in the earliest phases. And so as educated strength coaches and sports scientists, we're still generating buy-in from all of the stakeholders. Now, if we put ourselves in the shoes of some of these various stakeholders, here's what they might be seeing as they roll into that 6 a.m. testing battery. As an athlete, they may roll out of bed tired only to see the strength coach, which might be you, or the sports scientist, which might also be you, who seems a little bit too excited to be in the weight room that early at 6 a.m. The athlete might be intimidated. They might feel overwhelmed with all this new fancy equipment that they're being measured on. They might even be a little bit excited because, hey, now we're being measured just like you know the athletes were in Rocky or on that show, Sports Science, that used to play on the Discovery Channel. But most likely, they just want to get testing over with so that they can go back to bed for a couple more hours of sleep before their calculus class or get up to the dining commons for breakfast. Now put yourself in the shoes of the sport coach and here's what he or she sees. The sport coaches are masters of their craft, but that doesn't mean that they are always up on the latest technologies or evidence-based practice. They may be thinking to themselves, why is the strength coach having my distance runners jump on force platforms? Or why are my soccer athletes pulling on that bar that's not actually moving? How is any of this sport specific? Now imagine yourself as the athletic director, Mr. Moneybags himself or herself. These are the people who usually have MBAs, they balance complicated budgets, they have NCAA rule books to follow. You've convinced them to invest in this fancy sports science technology, these Hawken Dynamics force plates and the other tech that you've acquired, or perhaps even to invest in a salaried sport performance or sports science personnel. And they're just hoping that their investment will result in more wins this season. Now, if you're still following along with me, put yourself back in your own shoes. And as the strength coach or the sports scientist, let's pretend that testing goes well. Let's say that all of the athletes show up. Let's say that most of them were prepared for testing. Many of them remembered their shoes, remembered their first names at 6 a.m. in the morning, and you got testing done and out of the way. And now you're left with a mountain of data with which you have to sift through and try to find the signal through the noise. It's much like trying to decode the matrix for the first time and make sense of it all. You can't really do it without training, without understanding the underlying principles, and without employing some statistics. You've taken the first step in an athlete monitoring program, which is to measure and quantify underlying performance variables, but arguably the harder steps are to follow. How do we find meaning in these underlying numbers? How do we decode the matrix? So our entire goal of this video series is to generate that wall of data that is incomprehensible, to do some sort of a miracle to it, and then to operationalize that data, to allow it to play into the training programs that you're writing or that you're overseeing, to be driven 
by evidence from your own team and to apply best practices to the evaluation of that evidence so that, that it can guide the long-term training process. And this is where that MEO process comes into play. And it's structured in that order specifically. So first we monitor, we gather data, we quantify, we measure, then we evaluate it. We need to employ statistics, often simple ones, to make a meaningful evaluation of those numbers so that we know what they mean. Are they positive? Are they negative? Are they neutral? What do they mean for this athlete, for the group of athletes, for the athletes over time versus in this single situation? And then we operationalize that data. This means that we take those results from the stats. We visualize them usually because people understand pictures better than they do words and numbers. And then we use them to drive the training process. How do we make those results actionable? Now, the fourth step is to win more games, but I didn't want to put that as the official fourth step because then it's M-E-O-W, which spells meow. Now, the first step in this process and the one that we're going to dive deeper into in today's video is the measurement process or the monitoring process. It could stand for either of those, really. Now, there's a saying that goes around that says you can't improve what you don't measure. Now, this is not 100% true because you absolutely can improve on things, but if you don't measure them, then you don't know why you made those improvements and you can't reproduce it in the future to make consistent improvements, nor will you know why things go wrong when you stop making those improvements. So monitoring is of utmost importance in any type of training program. Now, monitoring is the process of observing, measuring, and recording the training process. We're going to give you some starting points, some low-hanging fruit, so to speak, so that you can get started on your monitoring today. So for those of you just getting started, the first step is to just go after low-hanging fruit. Maybe the first step is not to buy Hawk and Dynamics Force platforms, although that was mine when I got here to Point Loma. Granted, I had been doing sports science for several years already. It might just be collecting session RPEs, zero cost, minimal time, and it kickstarts the metacognition process in your athletes, forcing them to think about the training that they just did to give you a subjective RPE, which you can then take and multiply by the duration of the session and get a training impulse score. You can take those trim scores and do a lot with them. You can plot them over time. You can look at them over the course of the season. You can have standardized sessions that you look at the trim score uh, for that session one month versus the next month when you employ the same session again. You can look at differences between how freshmen versus how seniors respond to the same session. There's a lot that you can do, zero cost, limited time. The next thing that you can do is to impart ownership. So not only ownership amongst your strength and conditioning staff, maybe you ask the assistant strength coach to measure vertical jumps, during the warm up before the guys or girls come into the weight room, but also amongst your athletes. So by asking them for our session RPEs, now they're taking ownership of the training process. Perhaps you have them start writing in journals, their uh, sets and their reps and their volume. Maybe you give them lifting journals and they can write in their sets and their reps and their load so that over time you can track their tonnage, which is a measurement of volume. And now they have an idea of what they're lifting week to week. They can see their improvement or their lack of improvement. They can judge that against their session RPEs. And now you have a talking point and some monitoring data, some historical data that you can look back on and use to drive future training decisions. Now overall, and I've said this already, what we're trying to do is encourage a culture of metacognition and reflection. What did we do before that got us to where we are today? And how can we tweak it to make us better for tomorrow? That's what the entire monitoring process is all about. Now we do need to talk about the difference between a single testing session and ongoing athlete monitoring. Ideally, both of these run in parallel in your monitoring program. We have single testing days where we have one after another tests all arranged in a battery and the athletes show up ready to jump, to pull, to sprint, to do agility work. Uh, and then we have ongoing monitoring, which ideally would be more or less invisible monitoring, which we'll talk about later in the video. But this is monitoring the training process itself uh, during actual training sessions. So as a strength coach or sports scientist, you're measuring a sprint here or a 1RM there or the velocity on the barbell. And uh, using this data ongoing in conjunction with your uh, single time point testing data as well. Now, if you want to dive deeper into this topic, I have an entire video series dedicated to it over on my channel. The link's down in the description, but don't click away from this video yet. We have more to cover.
Now, the one constant in the long-term athlete development cycle is the athlete themselves. So as strength coaches and sports scientists, while they are under our care, we must encourage critical reflection upon the training process. This could be the most important thing that you teach your athlete because how long do you have them for? One year, two years, if they transfer away, maybe four years, up to five if they redshirt in the collegiate level. Very rarely do coaches have the privilege of overseeing an athlete's guidance for longer than about five or six years. And so we have to think about their uh, continued success after they leave us. Now let's talk about this concept of invisible monitoring. And no, I'm not talking about big brother or a surveillance state always watching you and tracking your every move. Although to be honest, we probably could do that with all of the wearables these days and cell phones and sleep trackers and just about every device being a smart device. What we're talking about when we're talking about invisible monitoring is actually that process of measuring outputs during the training session using training that the athlete is already going to undertake. So not adding at all to the fatigue status of the athlete through additional tests, but actually monitoring the current drills and lifts that they're doing already. <clears throat> now we do this to assess fatigue via protocols that occur within the normal training and competition process. For example, we can use daily counter movement jumps as a neuromuscular readiness indice. And we do this without adding additional load by layering it into the warmup of the athlete. So we know that many coaches use the RAMP protocol, which stands for raise, activate, and mobilize, and potentiate. And we can use the counter movement jump as the potentiation phase of the training session warmup. Now, in order to do this, you would need some sort of device like a Vertec or the Hawken Dynamics Force Platform system to quickly and e easily measure and evaluate that vertical jump performance. Now, what I really like about using force platforms for this is that it not only gives you the jump height quickly and easily, but it also gives you jump strategies such as reactive strength index modified, which is a measurement essentially of the athlete's ability to use his or her stretch shortening cycle. How reactive is this athlete? How elastic are they versus how much force do they have to generate with longer times under tension uh, during that propulsive phase of the jump? So using those force platforms in the warmup at the end of the ramp protocol uh, is a great way to assess the athlete's readiness before the training session. Okay, so you take them through the RAM of the warmup, and then that potentiation is several counter movement vertical jumps. Of course, you want to standardize this to make sure that you're getting good, clean data, but this then potentiates them for the squat session that's to follow. Now, once that's done, you can either th throw this data into a spreadsheet and track the data over time using something like plus or minus one or two standard deviations above and below a rolling average for each athlete. So you can note whether a jump is above or below that average um, and within those uh, standard deviation lines, or you can use Hawken Dynamics built-in cloud functionality um, either on the laptop or on the tablet to get this done. It's very quick, it's easy, it's low-hanging fruit, and it's invisible. It's part of the training process already. Now I've outlined for you the concept of measure, evaluate, and operationalize, which is the process of gathering data and then using it to drive performance. And in this video, we've taken that deep dive into monitoring and measuring, talked about some tools that you can use for zero cost, very little time, all the way up to some advanced tools like the Hawken Dynamics force plates that you can use uh, for a more in-depth analysis for that invisible monitoring piece. But now that you've started gathering all of this data, what are you going to do with it? And that's exactly what the second video in this series is going to tell you about. We'll cover coefficient of variation, smallest worthwhile change, and a load of other simple statistics that you can start employing right now to make your data understandable and actionable. You guys, I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, and my mission is to make real sports science education accessible and understandable. It's been an honor to partner with Hawken Dynamics in this video. And if you want to learn more about Hawken Dynamics or see more of my free sports science content, there are links down in the description. I'll see you guys on the next video.